Well, it's a great weekend to be here if you're new to Hope because we're going to be talking about why we do what we do. And it's a great weekend to be here even if you've been around Hope for a while because I'm going to remind you of why we do what we do because sometimes we forget and vision leaks and we get all focused on ourselves and we're like, oh, I forgot. This is why we do what we do. You know, our mission statement here at Hope is pretty simple. It's love people where they are and encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. And to be honest, there's a part of that mission statement that should be a part of every church in the world that claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ because Jesus actually gave the church a mission statement. Matthew chapter 28, Jesus is getting ready to go back to heaven and he gets his disciples together and he says, I'm leaving, you're staying, here's the deal. Till I get back, you get out there and make disciples. That's our mission statement. That's our part, encouraging people to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know, every church has a personality. Every church is unique. And what makes our mission statement unique is that first part where we talk about loving people where they are. We really do that. I mean, if you're new to hope, we don't care what kind of baggage you bring in here. We don't care what kind of mess you've made of your life. In fact, we actually like to run two messes. We're just glad you're here, right? Now, I got to tell you, that's not the kind of church I grew up in. And my guess is, it's probably not the kind of church that most of us grew up in. I mean, my church experience was basically, if you want to find God, you come on our terms. This is what we do, take it or leave it. In other words, the church was basically designed for Christians, people who were already in fam the family of God. They had made that decision to follow Jesus Christ. And preferably, they had gotten their act together. Because if they don't have their act together, it's going to be messy to have to deal with them. But you know, when I was getting ready to move here from California to start the church, I, I distinctly one day sitting in my office in California thinking, this is what Jesus said. It's not the healthy who need a physician, it's the sick. You don't have to take healthy people to a hospital. You have to take sick people to a hospital. And so I began to pray, God, when we move to North Carolina and start this new church, Will you help us figure out how to build a church, how to develop a church where someone who is lost, someone who is hurting, someone who is suffering, someone who has just been being beat down by the circumstances of life, they could walk in the doors, they could feel that it's a safe, comfortable environment to be themselves, and maybe in the process, they could find healing in Jesus Christ. And, and we kind of developed a, a, a saying, if you hang around the pond long enough, maybe you'll fall in. And what we mean by that is if you come and you hang around long enough and you let us love on you, we may be able to love you into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And, and God, we give him all the credit. Somehow he's been able to do that because we started with six families and now we have over 10,000 people over our campuses that consider Hope Community Church their home. And so God has let that happen. I got to tell you, to accomplish that, God had to teach me as a pastor how to think outside the proverbial church box. He had to remind me just how relevant he is, that he's never out of date. He had to remind me that, that nothing gets past him, you know. He, he's not blown away by advancements in technology. And I say that because I think often, you know, kind of our, our impression of God is he's an old man in a long flowing white robe and a long white beard with a cane, maybe sitting in a rocking chair somewhere in heaven, unsure of his next step. But I think it would blow our minds if we could get riveted into our head just how relevant God is. Nothing shocks him. He's, not, he's never in a rut. He's not out of style. He never gets out of date. The God who created the universe, who spoke it into existence, he's always relevant. He's always right there on the cutting edge of change. Not his message, but his way of getting his message across. And I think the church that's making a difference in today's world, in today's society, is the church that's not, you know, we're not playing around with the message. You don't change the message, but we stay on the cutting edge. It's the church that innovates, it sets the pace. It's the church that's not threatened by new ways of getting the job done, accomplishing the task. It's the church that's relevant. And this weekend, I want us to see how in Acts chapter 10 that God reminds us that he's always ready to bring about the necessary change to remain relevant in today's world. But before we get to Acts chapter 10, I want to share a couple of principles with you regarding change. And, and these, these principles apply in any area of life. I mean, if, if, if you have a family and you have small children and they're making that transition uh, into teenagers, there's going to have to be some transition, some change in your home. You can't raise teenagers and, and treat them the way you, you, you treated them when they were six or seven years old. There's transition. There's change at work. There's certainly change at church. So let me give you a couple of principles. Here's the first one. Some changes are inevitable. 
I mean, you can't even survive in society today unless you, you know, want to be one of those people like, you know, that go live in Alaska all by themselves. You can't survive in the world today without changes taking place. I mean, think about just the changes in transportation. Uh, I love my grandmother, probably one of the greatest role models. I can remember when my grandfather died, I, I literally moved in with my grandmother for two years and spent the night with her for two years. Uh, just to keep her company. And often I would wake up and there was this little gas burning stove in the room where I slept, which used to be her room, but being a grandmother, she moved to the couch, right? And she would be there at four o'clock in the morning. I'd wake up and I'd see her reading her Bible. That was just a godly grandmother, right? But I used to think in her lifetime, she used to say people went from riding in a horse and buggy to riding in a car to flying on an airplane to watching men land on the moon. I mean, think about the changes that took place in just her lifetime. I drive a big old F-150 Ford, right? Dual exhaust, Flowmaster. You women don't know what that is, but go home and ask your husband. I mean, it's that kind of loud truck that when I crank it up in the morning to go to the gym, it wakes up the neighborhood. I'm so proud of that, right? Well, I pull up at the stop sign the other day and there's a guy in a Prius. I don't know how any self-respecting man drives a Prius, but he's sitting there in the Prius. And my truck's going, woo, 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 woo. And they drive away. This is, this is, this is the sound the car made. See, I can remember being a kid and our teachers used to say, one day we're going to have electric cars. And I'm like, lay off the Jetsons. We're never going to have electric cars, right? But it's just changes in transportation. How about changes in communication? Anybody here old enough to remember having a party line? Anybody remember that? See, some of like, see, in the old days we had phones and they had wires that connected them to the wall and you couldn't take them anywhere. And so if you wanted to make a call, that's not how it worked. Well, on a party line, you might have two neighbors on your street that also shared your phone line. So you would pick up your phone to make a call and the teenage girl three houses down is talking to her boyfriend. So you'd hang up. Sometimes you'd listen. I mean, because, you know, kind of cover the, you know. But, uh, are, and then you'd go back in like 10 minutes, they're still talking. And finally you would say, hey, listen, my husband had a heart attack 40 minutes ago. I need to dial 911. Could, could you hang up? So, now, you know, 25 years ago, cell phones unheard of. Now every American can't imagine living without a cell phone. And then on top of that, we have email and texting and Facebook and Instagram and FaceTime. And I don't know why anybody wants to do that. Does anybody look attractive on FaceTime? Seriously, right? But there's always going to be changes. They're just inevitable. Here's the second one. Any change requires adjustment. And that is especially true in churches. You see, when I grew up, you needed a hymnal and a Bible and you could have church. Our idea of cutting edge was we had a little board on the front of the church to put the hymn numbers that we were going to sing. That's about as edgy as we got growing up. Now, I mean, you got to have a band, you got to have slides, you got to have video, you got to have moving lights. See, I'm old. I forget where I am sometimes. Sometimes I come to church and I'm like, am I at church or am I at the circus? I can't remember. And Laura has, honey, you have to preach. We're not at the circus, right? And so it just, it just, I mean, it changes. There's nothing wrong with it. But you know what? It just requires adjustment. Now, that was the lesson that Peter had to learn in Acts chapter 10. If you have your Bible this weekend, turn over there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then you get to the book of Acts. Peter's a Jew. Up to this point, he's been really only interested in reaching the Jews. By the way, he was very, very good at it. This is the guy that walked out into the streets of Jerusalem after the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, preached the gospel, right, that Jesus Christ died and was buried. Three days later, he rose again. We talked about that last weekend. And he shared that one message on some street corner in Jerusalem. And think about this, 3,000 Jews converted from Judaism to followers of Jesus Christ right then. So he's really, really good. He's been interested in reaching the Jews. Nothing wrong with that. But now there's a shift and God decides we're also going to reach the Gentiles. And see, we're glad that God decided to reach the Gentiles because if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. And that includes most of us here this weekend. So Peter gets this vision from God in Acts chapter 10. And basically God says, hey, Peter, heads up. It's a new day. Change is coming. This is what he says, chapter 10, verse 9 of Acts. About noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the rooftop to pray. He became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Now you gotta understand, these are things that Peter has never been allowed to eat. These are things that no Jew has been allowed to eat since, you know, the book of Leviticus. And now God is coming along saying, new day, these things are now okay to eat. But I want you to notice Peter's response in verse 14. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean, and I am not about to start now. I mean, that's just his attitude. You can just kind of sense the self-righteous, pious attitude. 
So God responds in verse 15, hey buddy, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. And if you read the chapter, this happened three times. And then Peter, led by the Holy Spirit, goes to the house of a guy named Cornelius. He, he, he's a Gentile. I used to love the King James. It says Cornelius and his Italian band. I thought that's the first original rock band. See, but we changed that with the new translations. He went to the house of Cornelius and his cohorts, okay? And he had a bunch of friends hanging out there who were Gentiles. And so Peter goes there. He shares the gospel. They accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. They receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Peter baptizes them, and then he decides that he's just going to stay and hang out with his new Gentile friends for a few days, okay? He has his first sweet pickle. See, up to now, it's been kosher deal, but a first sweet pickle. <laughs> he has his first pork chop barbecue sandwich, and he realizes there is some good perks coming out of this vision, right? And with pork barbecue still on his breath, he makes his way back to Jerusalem to his Jewish friends, and he's got trouble. Because his Jewish friends realize, hey, Peter's been hanging out with Gentiles and they want to know what's going on. So you get over to Acts chapter 11, verse 2. When Peter went to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers, that's a reference to the Jews, criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men, those are Gentiles, and ate with them. And I bet it was with this gasp, like, Peter, this is unheard of. And if you read on, it says it caused a conflict. The Greek word is, it, it divided them. And see, that's what change does. It, it has a tendency to divide people. So beginning in chapter 11, verse 4, Peter just begins to go step by step of what has happened, what God seems to be doing. And he explains how he received this vision. He explains to them how he went to the house of Cornelius. He tells them how he shared the gospel with these Gentiles and how they responded and that it was authentic and that it was unquestionable. And, and when Peter stood there and said, let me tell you something, guys, God is at work in a new and a fresh and a relevant way, they're like, what else are we going to do? We have to believe it. In fact, it says this in Acts chapter 11, verse 17. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the gift of salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit, he says, who was I to argue? Who was I to argue with? And, and the thing that impresses me so much is that when God flexed, okay, Peter flexed also. Now, here's my point. This is what I want to talk about this weekend. Sometimes, because of our nature, I think it's just in the nature of all of us, we all have a, a tendency, if, if we've been around church, if we've been around a religion for a while, if we were raised in it, we have a tendency to begin to consider certain things sacred when they're really nothing more than our preference. They're really nothing more than tradition. They're really nothing more than, hey, this is what I've always done, which is Greek for the mess we's in, right? But we've, we've done it the same way all of our life, and so we kind of come to this conclusion, this must be the right way to do it. I'm not changing. But you got to understand, when that happens, we can actually stand in God's way of uh, bringing about a change that he has planned. Peter said, I had to swallow my pride. I had to swallow my preferences. I had to swallow my prejudices. I had to face up the fact it's not the way I would have planned it. I had to face up the fact it's not even the way I like it, but who am I to stand in God's way? Now, let me just say this. Every one of us, there's certain things we just prefer about life. There's certain traditions we prefer. We all have fixations. By the way, Webster calls a fixation an unhealthy or excessive preoccupation or attachment. And I'm just going to tell you, including me, there's not a person in this room who doesn't have an unhealthy or excessive preoccupation or attachment to something. Every one of us, we have sacred cows. Every one of us have certain things that we like. We have a certain kind of teaching or preaching that we like. There's a certain kind of worship that we like. So that's, that, that's why some churches are very liturgical. People like that. Some, you know, you got people jumping over the seats. People like that, you know. But there's a style of worship you like. There's a style of music you like. There's a certain way you like people to pray. For many of us, if we grew up in religious backgrounds, there are certain ways we feel communion has to be observed. But you know what the Bible teaches about communion? Paul talked to the church at Corinth because they were making a mess of it. He said this basically. You need a liquid that represents the blood of Jesus Christ, and you need a solid that represents the broken body of Jesus Christ. Now, we've turned that into it has to be wine, or here at Hope has to be grape juice, because you guys would keep getting in the line and going through again if it was wine. See, I'm on to you guys, right? And it has to be unleavened little crackers. You know what? I think it could be water and saltines. I think if you're camping out, it could be 
Gatorade and a popper bar. I don't think God really cares. He didn't, specific, he didn't he specify exactly what you had to have for communion. But we've determined we know what's right, what God had in mind, right? Some churches believe you have to have it every time you have the service and hope we have it once a month. But there's nothing in the Bible that says about how often to have communion. It just says, whenever you do it, remember, it's about the blood that was shed and the broken body of Jesus Christ. But see, we get these things in our minds and we convince ourselves, this is from God. This is the way it has to be. And it's not from God at all. He may want to do something altogether new, altogether fresh. We just don't want to go along. We don't want to change. Basically, it's just more secure. It's more comfortable the way we've always done it. I mean, I've been pastoring for 33 years. It's amazing to me how we can support our preferences and our traditions, and we can literally convince ourselves we're doing it the right way. This is what God had in mind. But let me tell you something. When we begin to take stances like that on issues that really shouldn't be issues, that's when, that's when we stop flexing. And that's when we finally lose our edge and we lose our relevance with our culture. Now, I, I want to I uh, apply this by addressing two subjects, and they both have to do with our Christian faith. One has to do with some things are essentials. They're non-negotiables. Some things are non-essential. I mean, we have some room where there's some flexibility. The essentials are what we commonly refer to maybe as our doctrinal statement or our statement of faith, or we might even call them our core beliefs. But these are things that are non-negotiable. Let me, let me just give you a list of non-negotiables. The inspiration and an inerrancy of the Bible. What do I mean by that? We believe that the Bible is God's written word to us. And we believe that if God can speak the world into creation, if he can raise his son from the dead three days after he died, we believe that God can make sure that we ended up with the Bible that he intended us having. So we believe that it is his inspired, inerrant word to us. Therefore, since it's God's word to us and I didn't write it, I don't get to change it. You don't get to change it. Our job is not to adjust the Bible to fit culture. Our job is to adjust our culture to line up with God's word. See, remember, we see as God sees, we'll begin to do as God says. So we believe that the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God. We believe that God exists in the form of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We believe that. We're not going to negotiate that. We believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. That simply means this. God became flesh and he dwelt among us. We're not going to negotiate that. We believe he was born of a virgin. We believe that Jesus Christ lived a, sinful, a sin, sinless life. And because he was sinless and perfect and pure, he was the one who was qualified to die on the cross for man's sin. We believe that three days later, he rose from the dead. We believe, and this is non-negotiable, that one day Jesus is going to return to this earth. He's going to restore it to its original splendor. He's going to establish his kingdom. We believe at that time, all of those who chose to reject Jesus Christ and the offer of salvation, I know this sounds harsh, but this is what the Bible teaches, they will live forever and ever in a literal place called hell. And those who made the decision to follow Jesus, remember what he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one gets to the Father except those of us who've been reconciled back to God through Jesus Christ will live forever and ever with him in a literal place called heaven. Those are essentials. We're not going to change those. We're not even going to debate those things. But you got to understand, everything that wraps itself around those essentials there's some flexibility there. Those things can change, change like style, things like music, things like dress. And I say that you will not reach today's generation the way I was reached. You know why? There's been a change. See, when I grew up, you listened and someone talked to you. I don't know if you've talked to the new generation. That's not the way it works. They like to ask questions. They like to discuss. If you just want to talk down to them and you're not open to the response, they're going to they're shut you down. Things change all the time. Music changes all the time, people. I'm going to tell you something. If you want to mess up a church, mess with its music. You know, there's an old saying that when Satan got kicked out of heaven, he landed in the music department, right? And to be honest, I mean, there, there's a lot of truth to that. And I don't think it's any secret that we're going through a transition with our music. And let me just address this for a second because I get so many questions. These little get caught in the corners and in the hallways and at Target and everywhere about music. And a few years ago, I noticed a trend developing. Hope has always had an impact on the college campuses. We've always attracted a lot of college students, and that's important to us because, see, they are our future, right? So all of a sudden, I noticed even though we had a lot of college kids, we weren't, our percentage that we were attracting seemed to be dropping off a little bit, a trend. 
So I have a lot of friends who work in college ministry at NC State and different places, and I begin to pick their brain, and I, I speak for them a lot at different events. And I said, you guys hear the scuttlebutt. Why are the kids, we're not getting as many college kids as we used to. What's going on? And they said, well, honestly, they love the church. They just say your music's a little dated. I'm like, what? And I'm all upset because I, I love the music we're doing, right? Because I'm 50 years old. It's exactly what I like. But see, this is what I've learned in this process of going through this transition. We all grow up and become our parents. I mean, think about that. Do you remember when you became a teenager and you, the first time you got a little bit of money and you could start buying your own music? You know, for me, it was the Partridge family and Glenn Campbell, really edgy stuff like that, you know? But you remember that and your parents are like, why are you listening to that God-awful music? What is wrong with you? It's Satan and why can't you just like what I like? Because everybody believes that their music style is the best music style, right? Let me tell you something. Music and style always is flexible. It's always in the state of flex. It is always changing. And I'll give you an example. Raise your hand if you were driving this week and you just threw in a good old organ CD, some just, just pipe organ music. Anybody do that this week? Really? But everybody comes to church, what do they want to hear? Well, you've got to have a pipe organ in church. What's going on? Nobody listens to pipe organs during the week. Lift your hand if you downloaded your favorite choir CD this week onto your iPod, iPhone. Anybody? Load? See, we don't. music constantly is changing. I love hymns. I grew up on the hymns. And, and like, I love hymns like, all hell the power of Jesus' name. But see that next phrase, let angels prostrate fall. And all the young people are going, I did not even know they had prostate problems. Who is, who is addressing this? Angels with prostates falling. You know, this is serious. And, you know, and, you know, why can't we go back to the way it was? You know what I ask people? How far do you want to go back? You want to go back to when praise Music first started. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. You want to go back to that? That was so incredible, you know? Or you want to go a little bit further back? You want to go back to hymns with, with, with organs, you know? Or do you want to go back to hymns without organs? Or do you want to go a little further back? Do you want to go to Gregorian chants? I mean, how far back do you? We don't do this with any other part of life. There's nothing else in life as it evolves. We say, I, I want to do what we used to. Nobody goes home today, turns on the NFL on their 60-inch flat screen, high-def TV and say, honey, you know what I miss? That old 15-inch black and white with the rabbit ears, you know, weighed 600 pounds. I, I miss that TV. Nobody does that. When's the last time you got in your car and said, honey, you know what I miss? I miss cars with no air conditioning, <laughs> no power steering, no power brakes. And remember the crank? We were probably in the best shape in our life, honey. You know, I, well, I miss that. Anybody miss dial-up? <laughs> I mean, anybody miss that, you know? Anybody miss 22-pound cell phones? Nobody's saying, you know, you know oh, you know, nobody, nobody wants to do that. We only do that at church. But this is what we have to remember when it comes like to music where the style is constantly going to be changing. It's not just about us. But I get people who tell me all the time, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm not real happy. Get the head bob going, I'm not real happy with what's going on. <laughs> so I pray, God, give me, a, give me wisdom how to respond to this. You know, I don't want to offend people. Give me wisdom. And so this week, somebody cornered me in the office, and well, I'll tell you what, I'm not real happy with the music. And God gave me the perfect response. I looked at her, and I said, I don't care. I, I don't care. I cleaned it up. Now it's just, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you, right? And here's the reality. Do you think I like every song we sing? We have 10,000 people who come through here on the weekend. Do you think we can find music that everybody's like, I'm in, I love that music. See, no, it's not just about me. It's not just about you. That's why you have an iPhone. See, you can download your music and nobody can mess with it. That's your little kingdom, right? You don't have to listen to anything you don't want to listen to. But you got to understand when, when we come to church, it's not just about me. It's not just about you. At the end of the day, it's this, this simple. Worship is to point us to God and it's to lift up Jesus Christ because it says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to me. But I gotta tell you, the style is irrelevant. 
It's always going to be changing. Now, this is what I believe. I believe with all my heart that if Jesus were on the earth today, the message that he would deliver would not change one bit, but I think his style would be altogether different. And I really believe that a great deal of our struggles come when we confuse essentials with non-essentials. But it really boils down to our style and our preference. But we have to be really careful because you gotta understand it's in these non-essential areas where we have some flexibility and it allows us to remain relevant in our culture. In fact, I think one of the things that makes Hope unique is that we've been able to create around here an atmosphere of relevance and, and we've been able to create an environment where people, you know, it's just inviting, it's safe and people can show up and they can meet Jesus. I mean, you gotta understand something. Our mission has never ever to be big, has, has to be big, to be large. It's never been to be popular. We just simply believe this. As long as there's one person out there who's lost, we have a mandate to continue to reach out to them. And I get that from the parable of the lost sheep. Remember the shepherd took out 100 sheep, he got 99 back to the fold? A lot of us would say, hey, that's a good percentage, 99 out of 100, right? Not Jesus, not in his story. The shepherd said, you guys stay here, I gotta go find that one lost sheep. And if there's one lost sheep out there, we have an opportunity to reach. We have a mandate to have a seat in a parking place for them so we can reach out to them. Do you know what that means? It means the church doesn't exist just for us. It exists for the people who haven't shown up yet. So what does that mean to us? Well, when you really think about it, and, and I've used this illustration before, but I can't think of anything better. When you think about the church, whether it meets in a gym, whether it meets in a beautiful facility like this, a storefront or a home, the church, wherever God's people are together, it's a place where people come to get fed. And I know that the Atkins diet with all of its protein is really big these days, but I gotta tell you, in God's economy, carbohydrates are still king. Jesus didn't say, I am the pork chop of life, did he? What did he say? I am the bread of life. <laughs> and nobody would argue that the bread of life, the word of God, it deserves and demands the ultimate presentation. Because as I said, Jesus said, if you just lift me up, I'll do the heavy lifting. I'll do the dirty work, right? Now here's the challenge at Hope. Every weekend at Hope, we have people in attendance who are Christians. They've stepped over the line. They've decided to follow Jesus as we sang about this weekend. They are in the family of God. And just so you know, one of our goals every weekend is to give these individuals a healthy portion of the bread of life. We want them to feast on it. We want them to grow on the word of God. But I also know that every weekend we're gonna have a lot of people that walk in these doors who have never experienced a connection with God through Jesus Christ. They don't have that relationship. And if that describes you this weekend, let me just say this, we absolutely love having you here. And we hope that you sense this is a safe place to listen and learn. I used to go to a gym and it said no judgment zone. Maybe we should put that sign in here. This is a no judgment zone. But for those of us who are in leadership, it also means that we have to be prepared every weekend to minister to those who are already in the family of God and also those who have not made that decision yet. And to be able to do that week in and week out, we've just had to learn how to serve up the bread of life in creative and relevant ways. I always explain it this way, it's kinda like having a dinner party. You know, if Laura and I wanna have people over for dinner, we invite them. If they accept the invitation, we pick a night, you know, we pick a day that they can come over, and, and, and then we find out what do they like to eat, because we've learned the hard way, you don't wanna serve a T-bone to a vegan, they get kinda funny about that, and so, you know, once the invitation is invited, we go to work. We, we clean the house. Not that the house isn't clean, but we clean it a little more, right? And, and Laura's gonna figure out a way to prepare the food in an attractive way, and we'll put on a little music maybe, maybe even light some candles. But I'm gonna give you a secret. When it's just Laura and I, we don't do that. We grab something out of the freezer and throw it in the microwave, eat it off a paper plate. Sometimes, you know, we'll watch TV. If it's really good, Laura might belch, you know, and I, I see she doesn't do that when the guests come over. I pull her aside, say, honey, that is unacceptable. We don't do that in front of the guests, right? Now, here's the question. Here's the question. Are we phonies if we do that? Are they, don't, they're not seeing the way we typically, are we hypocrites? Are we selling out, you know, are we pulling a bait and switch? No. Hopefully, we're just being strategic and smart. Hopefully, we're just being a good host and a good hostess. In the same way, we have the opportunity every weekend to present the word of God, to serve up the bread of life. Here's where the rub comes. Do we only feed the already fed and already full? Or do we also serve up the bread of life to people who've never had the opportunity to really sample it? So think of it this way. Every weekend we entertain people. Many of you who show up, you're already in the family of God, but you gotta remember, we put a priority on those who are gonna show up who need a physician, who are hurting, who are lost, who are lonely. We think about the people outside the family of God. We think about the people whose lives are falling apart. We think about the people whose marriage is hanging in the balance. 
We think about that single adult that's just lost with no direction whatsoever. We think of that single mom who's just barely keeping her head above water and just trying to survive. She has no support whatsoever. We, we, we think about the student who's surrounded with thousands of kids on campus, but they're struggling with loneliness. We think about those people battling addictions and they're wondering where's my next meal gonna come from and am I gonna pay, be able to pay the bills to keep the lights on? We think about all those people. And I gotta tell you, when they show up, they become our VIPs. They become our guests. And we do everything we can to remove anything that would be a barrier, a hindrance to these people coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ. But you need to understand something. We do it without compromising our core principles and beliefs. For example, we make sure that our child care is secure. Everybody that gets anywhere near a child goes through a full background check. You know why? It's important to parents today because of the culture we lived in. See, when I was a kid, first grade, I walked to school by myself. I didn't need a little helicopter mom hovering all over me at the bus stop till I got on the bus. Hey, worry about the kids once they get on the bus. They'll find till they get on the bus. Don't worry about that. But see, it, times have changed, so we had to change with it. We have to make sure that all of our greeters are in place because, let's be honest, it's like six flags over Jesus around here on the weekend. And if it's your first time, it can be really intimidating. So we do everything we can to make our guests feel at ease and feel welcome. We try our best to keep our services to one hour. Do you know why? Because in today's culture, money is not the most important commodity. It's time. You can always make more money. So we're like, if you'll give us one hour of your time, we're going to do the best of our ability through God's power to present to you the Word of God. You're going to have to do what you want to do with it, but just give us an hour. You probably notice we don't take offerings around here. It's not that we forget. It's not that we don't need the money. It's just like we have decided that one of the number one reasons people say they don't go to church, I don't think it's true, is that all we want is your money. Well, let's just, let's just remove that barrier. We won't even put you in a situation where you feel out of guilt, you're obligated to give, or embarrassed because you don't have anything to give. And we decided we'll teach you who come every week biblical principles about giving, and there's boxes in the lobby, and you can give online, and you can use your phone app, but let's just remove that barrier, right? Some people say, why do you guys play secular music? And for, you know, it's, it's only 20% asking that because it's, it's the only 20% that are actually here when the service starts. And, uh, <laughs> but we usually have a secular pop song, you know, like Coldplay. We had Coldplay this weekend. Like, why would you do that? Well, there's several reasons. Sometimes it has to do with the theme of the morning. If I'm speaking on a topic, no, nothing tells us how the world feels about a topic, like it's music. So we can compare what's the world say. Or sometimes it's just to get something started to get people in from the coffee shop, let them know we're starting. Sometimes, you know what, if you bring a guest and they hear a song they recognize from the radio, their first thought is, wow, this isn't, this isn't what I thought it was going to be like. And their defenses, you know, kind of go down. They relax a little bit. But see, we do all this because we think if, if somebody outside the family of God is going to show up, this, this is it. And so we plan, we prepare every week. We sit around after the service and we evaluate and, and we ask ourselves, hey, how was the weekend? Was the music good? Was it excellent? Was the message relevant? If my neighbor that I've been inviting for a year, if they finally showed up, would they enjoy it? Would they come back again? You know, when I'm sitting and I'm writing my message, I don't ask myself, do, will they like it? This is what I ask myself. The guy that I've been trying to get to come from the gym for a year, if he shows up this weekend, he may not agree with it, but will he at least understand what I'm talking about? See, the gospel can be offensive. Paul said that. But I don't want to be offensive. So can I explain it in a way that everybody can understand it? And this is why this is so important. A lot of people that walk in here every weekend, they're struggling. They're hurting. I mean, things are right there teetering in their lives. It could go either way. This may be our only shot. And because they matter so much to God, we absolutely refuse to present to them a half-baked presentation of the bread of life. So we work really hard at being creative and authentic and relevant because if we're not relevant, let me tell you something. They're not coming back, and I don't blame them. I mean, who wants to go spend an hour somewhere every week where it has no relevance to your life and it bores you to death? By the way, let me just say this. A church shouldn't stand out when it does stuff in a different way. It should be the norm. All you got to do is thumb through the Bible and you see that God used, pre, uh, he, he used word pictures and he used illustrations to communicate his message. He used an apple with Adam and Eve. He used salt with Lot. He used a boat and a fish with Jonah. He used the cross for the world. When Jesus came and began to teach, he used the street language of the day. He kept it simple. He kept it relevant. There was one time he drew in the sand. Another time he sat in the boat. One time he picked up a child. One time he pointed to a sower. One time he talked about a building falling over. But he used parables, word pictures. Often he used humor, but he was always relevant. So when we get together on the weekend and we serve up the word of God, the bread of life, we want to do it 
in a way that everybody understands that I see Steve Ellis sitting back here. He says, you know, I hope we do a really good job of keeping it on the bottom shelf, keeping the cookies on the bottom shelf. We want people to understand it, to eat it, to digest it, to live it out. We want to explain it in a way that they walk out and say, I may not agree, but I got it. I got it. Now, why is this so important? I'll tell you why. Because right now there's a family in your neighborhood and they could care less about God and the church. In fact, the only thing they like about church is it keeps us off the golf courses and out of the restaurants on Sunday. I mean, they like like that. But other than that, they think church is pretty much for losers. And they think they've got it all together. But you know what? If you could peel back a few layers, you would find out that maybe, maybe there's a marriage that's about to implode. Maybe there are kids that are getting ready to go off the deep end. Maybe they're drowning in debt. But here's what's going to happen. Somebody in this church is going to invite them. And you're going to have an incredible, relevant church to bring them to. And every time you invite them, they're going to say no. Nope, 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 not interested. Nope, nope. And then one day, because a crack's going to start to appear in their life, they're going to say yes. And because of what we do every week, we have the potential to be the instrument that God uses to change their life. It will change their marriage. It will change how they raise their kids. It could impact the next generation. There's a guy, there's a woman that you work with every day, and you know what? They, are just, they just had it up to here with the dog-eat-dog dog world, and they get up every morning, and they go to work wondering this. Is this all there is to life? You get an education, you work your fingers to the bone, hopefully you get enough money to retire, and then you die. It's got to be more to life than that. And you're going to invite him here one weekend. And maybe they're going to get exposed to one of our ministries like Marketplace Matters. And, and they're going to find out there are people who have such passion about their work because they realize that their faith and their work go hand in hand, and their work is an extension of their relationship with Jesus Christ. And they're going to experience that, and they're going to begin to show up at work on purpose in life because now they have this relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a single mom out there, and she's exhausted. She's just tired. She's tired of getting home every day, having to get the kids a bath, having to get the kids' homework done, having to feed them, putting them in bed, getting up and starting it and doing it over and over and over and over again every day. And somebody's going to say, hey, you ought to come to our church. They have a great ministry for kids. And she's going to walk in here with those kids, and they're going to see Kid City, and it's going to blow their minds. And they're going to go in there, and then they're going to experience these people who love children. And they've been trained to work with children. And they're going to love on those children. And they're going to experience some men there, some godly men who who, who are very important in the business world, but set aside time to be mentors. And for some of these children, it will be the only male role model, positive male role model they have in their life. And a mom's going to begin to see a difference in her kids. And then she's going to bring them to Kid City Live. And she's going to realize, oh, now there's a way that we can go on this journey together. And it's going to begin to change your life. There's going to be a college co-ed out there. She has tried everything to feel better about herself. And she's going to get invited here. And she's going to meet some great college kids that have a different take on life. And her life is going to be changed. And it's going to be because someone cared. You say, Mike, how, how do you know that? Well, I know it because, see, those are the stories we hear every week. But I'll tell you this. When we stop being relevant, we stop hearing the stories. This past Saturday night, I have a good friend and uh, a professional friend. We've been friends for a while, and he's worked here with the church, done some consulting with our board and all, and been a personal consultant for me as a friend. And this past Saturday night, his wife, my age, was preparing dinner for their small group who was coming over and and she dropped dead of a a brain aneurysm, no health issues whatsoever. And so Tuesday night, I flew out to Denver for a funeral, attended it Wednesday morning. And uh, you know, I don't know about you, when I go to funerals, I reflect, you guys do that? Because you you hear what they're saying about people and you're like, well, what would they say about me, you know? But as I was listening, uh, I was listening to a life well lived. It's just like God got my attention. God just grab you every once in a while and say, Mike, you haven't been bringing your A game lately. You've been sloughing a little bit lately. And you know, it's so funny. I don't know why God brought this to my mind. Maybe it's because somebody mentioned it, but you know how we all get that bucket list? Like, these are things we have to do before we die. Like, I want to go to every SEC stadium and see a college football game. You know, I got all these things I'm going to do. You know what God told me? That's stupid. He used the S word, you know? <laughs> Why do you want to spend all your time and financial resources doing that? When at the end of your life, the only thing that's going to really count is what you've done for me. See, when I stand before God one day, 
He's not gonna say, hey man, did you get your bucket list done? Mm -mm. He's gonna basically say this, I gave you some time, I gave you some talent, I gave you some treasure. How did you invest it for my kingdom? And sitting there at that funeral, I just gotta tell you, I re-upped. I re-upped. And I would challenge you because, you know, when I think about the impact we could have in our community, we're probably hitting at about 15% of our kingdom potential, the impact we could have in our community. You know why? Because some of you, you're just sitting there on the sidelines with your arms crossed. Some of you, you have no idea what your spiritual gift is, so you're not serving anywhere. You're managing mountains of financial resources, and you're not even tipping God. You've never been connected in a meaningful community relationship like in a small group. You can't remember the last time you shared your story with an unbeliever. I would say about 15% of hope is doing that. What if we got it up to 25%? What if we got it up to 50%? But people said, I'm getting off the sideline. I want to get in the game. You know what? I used to play sports. You know what the most embarrassing thing is? Walk off the field with a clean uniform. Don't you want to, don't you want to stand before God a little bit bruised and bloody and muddy and dirty and sweaty and say, God, I just want you to know I left it all on the field. That's where I left it. I mean, what else do you want to do with your life other than make a difference in things that really last? Let me challenge you. Get off the sideline. Get in the game. I met a family here this morning. They came last night. You know why they came back today? They say, we had friends who wanted to come back today, and this is what the wife said. We're coming into the game. That's cool. Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to be in your game. It's your game. It's your story. You're the director, as we're going to see as we start a new series next week. You're the main character. We're just, you're even the casting director, and you decided what our role is going to be, and we just are to play it to the best of our ability. And, but, Father, right now we have this opportunity to reach this community, this triangle, to make a difference here, and we're just coming to church like it's going to the movies, and we run in, and we get our seat, we get our little spiritual fix, and we run back, and it makes no impact on our lives whatsoever. That's not a church. That's a country club. And you didn't call us to be a country club. You called us to be your body, the representation of you on this earth. Father, I pray we'd put, we'd just put our big boy panties on and grow up and be what you've called us to be so we can do what you've called us to do. In your name we pray, amen.